transcription options. So all that said, I am very pleased to welcome Brian Brown from New York State IPM. And I'm gonna turn the mic over to him. He's gonna tell you about what they do and um, talk to us about some innovative forms of weed control. Great, thanks Carla. Thanks for having me. Uh, excited to be here. And uh, so yeah, um, New York State IPM is part of Cornell and um, we're based uh, in Geneva, New York. That's where our, our office is, but there's IPM, um, employees across the state and um, uh, you may actually work some with Ken Wise who's based um, close to, to your neck of the woods there near Delaware County. Um, but yeah overall IPM integrated pest management is um, kind of a way to look at pest management that tries to manage pests as effectively as possible but also take into account um, kind of environmental effects and human health effects that it might have and kind of balance all of those things. Um, so today I'm going to talk about weed management or vegetables using an IPM kind of framework or, or way to think about it. And uh, this was actually a recorded presentation that I made uh, for Massachusetts. Um, so I, I do mention Massachusetts a couple times, but just ignore that. Um, and if you have any questions as we go along, as Carla mentioned, just put them into the chat and I'll be keeping an eye on that and um, answer those as we go. Um, so I think that's all. And I think we can just go ahead and start the recording of the uh, presentation. Uh, split between research and extension. So I'll be talking about some research and some uh, some extension projects I've been working on as well. Um, and so today I'm going to be talking about how we can take the principles of IPM, which you know, if most people hear IPM, they probably think of thresholds of when to spray for a certain pest. Um, and if you don't have enough pests to warrant uh, the cost of the spray, then you don't spray. Only spray if there's enough pests to um, that you're over your your damage threshold. Um, but you know, IPM is is a lot more than that, and and a lot of the principles of IPM are captured in this IPM pyramid. And I'll be coming back to this, and I've I've kind of structured my presentation today based on this pyramid. So. Um, you know that chemical controls herbicides in, in this case with weeds are you know very effective and so they're at the top but um you know they're also uh you know they can potentially damage or injure your crop um you know there's there's environmental considerations with herbicides and so for ipm we like to try to prioritize these these um practices and weed control tactics that are below chemical. So kind of the, the baseline uh, practices to try to, um, you know, control as many weeds as we can through just thinking about our rotation and, and, and preventing weeds from setting seed and, and things like that. So that our, our higher level controls, our more expensive controls can be as effective as possible. So I'm going to start at the bottom and work my way to the top. So starting with prevention, uh, I'm going to talk about why it is important to prevent weeds from setting seed. I think most of us know that's a bad thing, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of times it's it's just hard to to get out there and prevent them from doing that. You have to be very effective in your weed control to stay on it um, and it can be uh, time consuming labor consuming and, and costly but i think it's worthwhile because if you look at this uh, this picture of an onion field this is uh, an experiment i did uh, back at university of maine and a few plots in these fields were intentionally allowed to uh for the weeds to go to seed as you see here mostly lambs quarters and some others Coming back the next year, boom, there's that plot 
and you can see all of those weed seeds just went right into the soil and that corn which we followed up the onions with in those plots where the weeds went to seed really had to compete with the weeds and lost out on yield big time um and i think the the weed emergence in those plots was about 10 times that of the surrounding plots so it just shows you know weeds can produce so many seeds thousands some of them approaching a million seeds per plant if you let it um, thrive without competition. So it's really important to try to prevent them from setting seed. And the old saying, uh, you know, one, one year seeding is seven years of weeding uh, really, really does have some truth to it. Um, but it's, it's not quite that simple. Um, this is, this is, a more accurate representation of how long weed seeds live in the soil and the longevity of most weed seeds follows something called a half-life so how long does it take for half of those seeds to become inviable in the soil mm -hmm. and for most of our well not maybe not most but for a lot of our problem weed species like here crabgrass red root pigweed common lambs quarters horseweed mm. they have a half-life of around a year so that means if if you just um if if you're able to prevent any new seeds from entering your soil then half of those seeds that are in your soil uh from previous year's seed rain will uh, die of natural causes from weathering um, and microbial action. So we have that on our side. This is, I think, really good news. And, and you know, of course, some people will say, well, look at the tail out here. You know, there's a few seeds that live for, you know, a hundred years maybe. But um, yes, but I think that you know, overall, this is good news for growers in that if you can just do a really good job for a few years, and I've seen growers do this for three or four years and have, you know, a completely different weed situation after that. Uh, also, back at the University of Maine, I was part of some studies that looked at the, the number of weed seeds in growers' soil, and so I I took samples of soil from different farms and then grew those those uh, soil samples out in the greenhouse and then counted the weeds that emerged. And there was a lot of variability based on the different farms. You know, some of these, these seed banks were full of weed seeds, uh, as on the left here, thousands of weeds per square foot of soil. Uh, whereas others, like on the right, were pretty empty of weed seeds and and so those farmers would have a lot easier time of farming now but uh, i think it would have taken a few years of those farmers on the right trying to really actively prevent weeds from setting seed but, all right so there's a few options if you do have a a disaster year and your early season weed control just didn't cut it. Um, weeds are, are, have overtaken your crop. Um, I mean, if it's really bad, I would consider just tilling in that, that area and just, you know, that's the easiest, quickest way to do it. Mow and then till. Um, some growers would try to maybe mow at the height just above the crop level to take off those, flowering and uh, seed heads before this the seed uh, fully matures um, and a newer option is this that's that's on the slide here the the weed zapper which there are now they're available for hire and this is a use of, of high voltage electricity to actually shock weeds that are above the level of the crop and that electricity runs down into the root um, killing killing most of the plant but if you know if if it's too late and the weeds have already set seed 
those seeds are starting to rain down into your soil, um, you, you do still have some options. You could think about doing different types of tillage. Moldboard plows are good at inverting the soil. And so you can see here on the left that the moldboard plows typically put that seed four to six inches um, deep where most of our small weed seeds are not going to germinate and emerge from. They just don't have the energy. Um, and so they'll stay down there for as until you mold board again and, and pull them up. Um, unfortunately, weed seed decay um, is not as, as rapid at, a, at that depth. So um, the half lives that I was talking about earlier are longer than I showed um, than at the soil surface. Um, whereas chisel plowing kind of just works in those seeds a little bit, two to four inches where they may be able to germinate. And then no till of course leaves them right on the soil surface where, you know, rains and frosts will kind of work them in over time. Um, but while they're right on the surface, they are subject to, um, being eaten by beetles, by mice, by birds. There are a lot of, of animals that eat weed seeds. Um, and some work has shown that, you know, up to 50% of them can be eaten in a given year. So that's, that can be a big help. And then if you go with a no-till or, you know, just leave those weed seeds right on the soil surface, then the next year they are going to be more likely to germinate know, getting all that heat and, um, you know, weeds, most weed seeds like to germinate within the top inch or half inch of the soil. So something that I would con consider is, you know, if I had a bad year last year is in the spring, just encourage as much weed seed germination as possible. Um, some growers will lightly till, maybe cultipack, even irrigate to try to encourage germination and then control all those weeds before you plant your crop. Um, and so that's kind of the, the principle behind the stale seed bed idea. They remove as many seeds as you can before planting. Okay, back to IPM pyramid. So that's prevention. Uh, any questions on prevention, feel free to shout them out. Um, otherwise, I'll move on to cultural practices. And for cultural practices, I'm really thinking about crop rotation and, and cover cropping and how those interact with the, the life cycle of weeds. <clears throat> Typically, the problem weeds for a given field fit nicely within the typical crop rotation in that a farmer typically selects for weeds that um, can complete their life cycles before harvest and before tillage or, or burn down of, of the crop or cover crop. So thinking about ways to shift the timing of planting and tillage and harvest uh, for a given field is a good idea. And this is why. Weeds have very different um, periods for when they typically emerge, germinate and emerge from the ground. And this, this is some work from, I believe it was Iowa, but um, somewhat similar um, uh, temperature and, and uh, climate conditions as the Northeast and that it's, you know, it's still cold. Um, but down here, the months are adjusted based on growing degree days. You see that April is really short. May is pretty short. And then June, July is the longest. Um, so growing degree days, this is uh, the, the, the number of degrees above 50 degrees for a given day. So if your average temperature, you average the
Um, so growing degree days is something that you can keep track of on your own, or um, you can check out the NUA website, N-E-W-A, uh, Network uh, for Environment and Weather Applications, which uh, has a number of weather stations throughout the Northeast. And chances are there's one pretty close to you where you can check out your growing degree days and see how this matches up for your problem weeds. Um, Cornell is also creating a, an emergence model for several weed species that uh, should be up and running within the next couple of years. Um, so if you see any of your problem weed species on here, you could say, hey, okay, say ragweed up at the top, uh, second one down, that has a very, very uh, short spike of emergence very early in the season, April, early May. Um, so, you know, if ragweed, for example, is your primary problem weed, then it looks like maybe you could uh, move tillage, you know, earlier, uh, delay planting so that you can control this weed um, bef and, and, um, till and have it start with a clean slate after ragweed has finished emerging. Uh, whereas some of the others, um, you know, ones that we're, we're dealing with in New York, like common uh, water hemp down at the bottom have a long emergence period. So you're going to have to think about controlling, you know, having good control throughout, uh, throughout the season, either through repeated uh, tillage, mulching, or repeated herbicide or residual herbicide usage. So uh, here's a bit of an example of what I was just talking about in that weeds typically, annual summer annual weeds typically set seed in mid-August. This is when they start setting viable seed. So if you can design a crop rotation to finish up before mid-August, then you are likely preventing uh, all of those seeds from, all of those weeds from producing seed, which is great. Um, or you could think about, you know, delaying doing the, the stale seed bed technique and on the bottom here, repeated harrowing or burn down herbicides and then do a late crop um, but again, you're going to need some late season or, uh, or residual weed control to prevent seed production. I also include mulch under um, cultural controls, uh, both plastic mulch or um, this is, I believe, a, a hay bale that's being unrolled here. And um, there's definitely um, an art to plastic mulch. And uh, I'll say a little bit about that more uh, later on. But for hay or straw, you really need about nine tons per acre um, is kind of the, the standard for effective season-long weed suppression. Um, plastic mulch is, is, you know, people love it and they hate it. Um, it has a lot of great horticultural benefits from warming the soil and such. Um, saving labor for, for hard to, uh, hard to control, um, <laughs> crops. Uh, but, you know, in cases like this, it's also, it also can require more labor in some cases for hand weeding those holes, um, and the edges, the interface between the plastic and the, the tire tracks, the wheel tracks can be difficult to control. There are some mechanical tools. There's some um, basically finger weeders on their sides that go through. There's some brushes uh, of different stiffnesses that can control that interface. Um, and um, and some uh, broad uh, shielded applications of herbicides as well. But yeah, so a big thing that I see is that a lot of growers, unfortunately, their planting hole is giant. And that kind of defeats the purpose. I know it's hard to get some of those transplants in there, but um, you know, see what you can do to really minimize the size of that planting hole. And in some cases with crops like onions or, or crops where the stem uh, increases over time, um, the crop will stretch that planting hole. So there's, there's really no uh, airspace between the plastic and the crop. And so it can really 
effectively smother out weeds. Some other mulching examples, um, you know, it's, it can be expensive and labor, um, costly for labor to bring in hay or straw. So some growers will grow the mulch in place, so to speak, with, with crops like, like buckwheat shown here, which is seeded in the spring and then mowed down at, at flowering to um, basically grow your own mulch. Um, or in the case of rye, this is planted in the fall. After a crop of tomatoes was grown on this mulch, the, the black plastic mulch, which was left in the ground. And so the grower got two seasons out of this plastic mulch and um, then mowed down that rye at flowering to uh, provide a, a nice uh, straw mulch over the paths. I have and a question of course, that yeah, yeah. Um, then how do they get the plastic out of there after two years? Is it like difficult to, I feel like sometimes after one season, it's like coming it, apart. It, it, yeah, it can break up and yeah. Um, I, I haven't followed up with this grower to know if, if, if he has one of those mechanical, um, kind of uh, mulch uh, removal tools uh, or if it's just by hand um, but that's a good question yeah I would imagine that it would it would potentially be a little bit more difficult especially if there's hay or other residue on top of it or maybe it'd be easier I don't know <laughs> yeah. okay thanks yeah, so for some of the, the heavier duty mulches or, or tarps, um, I, I created a little table to just kind of compare and contrast. So starting on the left, um, some of you may have heard or, or tried uh, solarization. So this is clear plastic. And this is done usually in the summer months when it's hot to superheat the soil. And the key with solarization is um, burying the edges, which either takes time or takes a special um, uh, plastic layer as shown there um, to seal all that heat in. And it's done after a rain or irrigation because you need a wet heat rather than a dry heat, but it can actually increase the soil up to 120. Uh, and right at Cornell, I had a, um, a soil uh, temperature probe at uh, about one or two inches deep and we got 120 degrees uh, just in the second day um, one sunny day and so that can actually kill weed seeds some of them not all of them but you can reduce your weed seed bank at least this, the seeds that are in the top inch or two uh, using solarization uh, and then it'd have to be removed before planting uh, landscape fabric is one that that uh, some growers will will burn holes in and and plant right into uh, and use it repeatedly, maybe five years or so, um, uh, or for for walkways. And then tarping uh, with with silage tarps. This is black plastic, a thick, um, I think like six mil black uh, silage tarp. And this, this is more flexible than solarization because it doesn't require that hot, sunny weather. You can leave it on in the fall or over the winter. And it's, it's basically like pressing pause on, on, you know, if you till and you've got everything clean and ready to go, you can make your beds the year before, put the tarp on. And then, you know, when you're, whenever you're ready to go in the spring, remove those and, you know, plant immediately. Um, they they tend they tend to make the soil very friable as well, um, so they've got a number of benefits, and they do, I think, um, reduce the weed seed bank to some extent, not to the same extent as solarization though. And some growers have used them to terminate cover crops as well. All right, so uh, next rung up the ladder: physical mechanical control. Okay, we're just uh, pausing the video for a second in case uh, anyone wants to ask Brian any questions. I've seen some good ones coming through in the chat. Brian, anything you want to say verbally for the answers you've been given? 
There you go. Great. Yeah, um, there's been a couple so far um, on um, solarization and uh, the and the different colors of plastic. I haven't used that many colors. You can get red, green. Um, you know, black is the most common. Um, and it can really heat up the soil nicely. Heating the soil is great um, and typically desirable, especially for heat loving crops like uh, tomatoes or um, a lot of the melons. Uh, that's where it's probably most common. Um, sometimes if you heat the soil too much, uh, some of the crops will mature too quickly. I've had that happen with onions. Um, and so I mentioned that silver mulch is becoming, I think, more common for onions. Um, but yeah, so solarization using clear plastic, uh, you know, if you've got an old greenhouse piece of plastic that you can use, um, you know, put that on the ground uh, over the summer months uh, when it's hot and sunny and uh, patch any holes that are in it because you really want to keep the heat in and apply it after a rain. And it can really do wonders killing weed seeds in the top inch or so of soil. So right. yeah, I think that's good for now. Super, we'll keep going then. All right. And I'm primarily gonna talk about cultivation. And uh, of course, cultivation shown here can be really effective uh, between crop rows. You can drag just about any piece of metal between the crop rows and kill weeds. But down on the bottom, uh, you know, it's a lot harder to kill weeds actually in that crop row with cultivation. So this is an area where I've done um, a fair amount of work. And um, I've been working primarily with this, this tool on the left um, uh, made by Hawk, but there's a few designs with um, a rear uh, rear steering system. So you can, the tractor driver doesn't have to be dead on. Um, there's some flexibility because you've got someone in the back that can move the cultivator, I think six inches left or right of center uh, to keep the crop, to keep the cultivator right centered on the crop, which is important for using some of these in-row tools. Uh, another simple kind of guidance system is, is just a belly mounted cultivator. So you turn you, so you turn left, the, the cultivator actually goes left. Um, and then, you know, on the, on the expensive, ex, you know, the far end is camera guidance and GPS guidance. Um, but these are really, really helpful for improving your in-row efficacy of controlling weeds. You can get a lot closer to the row um, and you can be more aggressive. And when we're controlling weeds mechanically in general, you're doing it in one of three ways. You're either cutting the weed at the base, you're pulling out the roots and letting it dry out in the sun, or you're burying it so that it, it cannot see the sun's rays and um, photosynthesize. And um, one thing that I've always liked to show growers is some, some work that uh, I've been doing the past few years looking at uh, what I call stacking. So using not just one in-row weed control implement, but stacking on two or even three like here. So this is a setup with sweeps at the front on the left, followed by finger weeders, followed by some small discs. Um, and, the, and this is a slow motion video, by the way. Uh, in snap beans and in this video so this is this is that cult um, cultivator that I'm using uh, that was in the previous picture but I really didn't have to steer it at all because this was GPS planted and the tractor um, uh, pulling the cultivator in this case was on that same GPS line so it really helped out and um, the other thing is that so we've got sweeps, which are undercutting, and then we've got finger weeders, which are basically uprooting weeds. And then we've got the disc killer, which is burying. So we've got those three kind of mechanisms for mechanically killing weeds all in one setup. And this, this setup 
I found to uh, regularly control 90% of the in-row weeds. As long as, as long as you've done a good job um, getting the crop up out of the ground ahead of the weeds. Brian, I have a question. Yeah. Um, this seems really cool, but also maybe a lot of farmers in Massachusetts anyway don't seem to be using GPS planting and, and those yeah. kinds of things. I wonder, um, can you get close to that um, if you don't have those precision planters? And then also, how expensive would a setup like this cost with that sort of behind the implement steering and this multiple tools? Yeah, um, so we bought a two row unit and I I think it was with all the you know, sweeps and the fingers and the the finger and the uh, discs, I think it was around 10, 10 grand. Um, and so you can, you don't need the GPS um, because you have that rear side shift adjustment in the back, that extra person on the back, what it does just really reduce your, your crop damage and how aggressive you can be. Um, I, I did some similar work back at UMaine with, um, without the GPS and, uh, crop damage was maybe 10 to 15%. Efficacy was, was, you know, around 90. So similar to this trial, but the crop damage was 10 to 15% mortality for each pass. Whereas in this trial, um, it was zero to 5%. So okay. Thanks. It's something to factor in. Yep. If so. there are any other questions, feel free to drop them in the questions box anytime. Thanks. All right. Um, and I think more important than the tool setup and and the tool you know what kind of implement you're using is the timing for in row cultivation even if you're just using sweeps and you're just trying to you know throw some soil on that in row zone um the timing you you really have to be targeting those in row weeds at the cotyledon stage so less than one inch tall is when they're most susceptible to in-row cultivation. Any any later than that, and your your effectiveness really drops quickly, unfortunately. And this is just some some recent uh, work that I've done, looking at okay, over all of these trials uh, that I've done, and and some from Michigan how much of the of the selectivity which is i guess uh you know how how good the tool is at pulling out the weeds while leaving the crop how much is that related to the difference in height between the weed and the crop and uh it was actually the main determinant was this ratio of the the, the height of the crop to the height of the weeds so um, in this case, one of the trials, the most effective one over here on the far right, a ratio of around seven. So the crop was, say, seven inches tall and the weed was, you know, around one inch tall. So that is that's an ideal situation when you can be really effective. And it's it's about how do you get there? Um and I think still seedbed is important to give you that delay, give you that head start um, with the crop. And I think residual herbicides are a good option beforehand. Um, and then there's always, um, you know, hand weeding once early on to just remove those in-row weeds, get the crop up, and then after that, allow the, the in-row cultivation to take over. But yeah, you see the different colors here, the different shapes are the number of in-row implements. And I found that that didn't really matter uh, in terms of selectivity. So, you know, 
so this is crop mortality at 80% efficacy, which I'm, which is kind of my proxy for selectivity. And this was done through modeling. Um, so even if the crop, even if the cultivator only killed 20% of the weeds, um, I modeled it up to what that would look like at 80% efficacy by increasing the crop mortality to the same extent. Um, and it turned out that, that the number that if you're stacking tools, that that didn't have an effect on the selectivity. It wasn't more effective and it wasn't uh, less selective. So, all right. Um, there was biological. a question, yeah, question about the finger weeders. Um, yeah. Are, do those work well in situations where you have crops on drip or does the drip tape get tangled up in there? Um, um, I would potentially use drip if it was buried. Um, you know, if you're burying the drip you know, right next to the crop row, I think it's what, two inches deep. Um, then I'd go for it. Otherwise, no. <laughs> no, not drip irrigated stuff. But like brassicas, mate. What what other crops would you recommend these for? Oh, I mean anything as long as it's um, you know as long as it's at least um, at least maybe five inches tall and you know but not more than however however tall the you know the cultivator needs to be to get through maybe a foot and a half. Anything in that zone that hasn't um you know branched out too much and the more the crop branches out you can just adjust the finger weeders to instead of you know being overlapped uh, you can just move them out a little bit or or just drive slower um you know, the, the speed is a really easy way that growers can use to control the aggressiveness um so yeah driving slow is less aggressive than driving fast obviously okay i'd be curious to know also like how many growers there's a small group of 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 commercial growers on the call here so um just curious if you guys uh feel like using the question box to maybe just say i've used finger weeders and they work great or um you know those kind of comments might be interesting for discussion also absolutely go ahead brian thanks yeah. Okay. Um, so for weed control, for vegetables, we're just not there yet for biological control. But you know, the next rung up here uh, in other crops, we have some options with with you know potentially different animals or um, you know or, or insects that can uh, predate upon weeds. Um, but unfortunately, those tend to be generalist and would likely uh, predate on the crops as well for vegetables. So I'm going to skip that for now and um, go up to chemical controls to finish up here. So just to set the scene, you know, unfortunately, we are in a bit of a crisis with herbicide resistance. And it is, it's really on the rise and um, it, is uh, states in the in the northeast um, don't necessarily have that many uh, herbicide resist resistant weeds listed on the registry online, but they are there. Uh, and New York only has four listed, but there's at least twice that, and they're becoming more more and more common. Um, one that you may be seeing may have already in mass massachusetts is um herbicide resistant horseweed or mare's tail which is resistant to glyphosate and um and uh, als inhibitors which i'll talk about later but uh this develops when unfortunately uh you know growers will re rely on a certain herbicide and use it year after year and if that is the only selection pressure that those weeds are facing and there's one that happens to have a mutation that survives it 
and produces seeds and spreads. Um, and that's how the problem can proliferate. Um, so one of the most basic things that, that is being, um, touted as, as really important for growers to do is to try to diversify the, the herbicide families. Um, and a good way to, um, simplify that for yourselves is to look up herbicide modes of action. And there's uh, a number of different tables. Of the, probably just the first website that comes up will have one of these charts and it really breaks it down nicely. So you can see, okay, um, for example, okay, 2,4-D, dicamba, stinger, these are all in the same group. So, um, you know, I need to be diversifying to try to uh, limit the amount of resistance that's building up. I need to be using uh, a more diverse array of herbicides. So, you know, for example, if, uh, you know, if you're just looking at the name, you might think, okay, 240 and dicamba, they're different products, um, but really they're acting very similarly inside the weed. And so they're not, they're not doing much different um, in terms of, trying to prevent resistance from building up. And uh, this is a, a picture I took of, of one of our herbicide resistant weeds in New York called water hemp is in the pigweed family. Looks a lot like pigweed. And this was hit with um, a glyphosate and, uh, and dicamba. And it's, um, it's, it's resistant to glyphosate. It's, it's, I don't think it's resistant to dicamba yet in New York but it was just too tall. You have to get this weed when it's less than four inches tall. And the same is true with horse weed. So they say um, if it's larger than a soda can, it is really hard to kill with just chemicals. So you've, you've got to be vigilant. You've got to get it before it gets to that size. And that's, that's a good practice to do in general. Um, you can see here, these got healthy branches growing out of this, this injury. And uh, this is, unfortunately, herbicide resistant weeds make growers do, you know, revert to some, uh, some drastic measures here. And we are just getting the, uh, the weed whacker out to try to prevent this water hemp from producing seeds and it's flowering right here. Um, and we're just trying to get it beforehand. Um, I have to say, this is my weed management strategy of, um, well, last resort, but also I seem to end up doing a fair bit of it every year. Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, so you have growers that, you know, they're, they're, hand pulling weeds out of soybean and cornfields because they don't want these things to go to seed because that if it does then it basically means that you know roundup or or whatever their cheapest and most effective options are are not going to cut it so it's going to really increase their costs in the future um so that that's why they're going to these drastic measures to control these weeds. And here's water hemp, very similar to pigweed or your, your um, more common red root pigweeds and smooth pigweeds. has a little bit narrower leaf uh, and it's hairless. So that's, that's the big uh, thing to look for. No hairs on the stem, unlike most of our other pigweeds. So if you see that, uh, let someone know. Get help. <laughs> uh, and then here's horse weed. Probably a lot of you have horse weed already, but perhaps not the herbicide resistant biotype. Uh, horse weed looks very similar to goldenrod. Uh, I get calls um, on you know distinguishing between them. And the easiest way for me is that the leaves of horse weed are widest, a little bit closer to the tip. Of the leaf, whereas goldenrod leaves are widest closer to the base of each leaf. Hope everyone sees that. Okay. 
Um, but horseweed, unlike most of our problem weeds where the seed just drops straight to the ground, and that's where it stays unless you till it, um, horseweed has windblown seed, and that seed can travel for miles. So uh, unfortunately, we have it in New York, and uh, the wind is blowing to mass. So um, be, be on the lookout for that. And once again, it's resistant to glyphosate and ALS inhibitors, which are group two, if, uh, if you're looking at mode of action charts. So uh, what are some of the options for the common herbicides for vegetables? I've listed a few here. Um, and I've also listed their Weed Science Society of America group. So this is the mode of action that I talked about earlier from that chart. Um, and you can see that there's a few group threes. Uh, there's quite a few group 15s. There's some group 14s. Um, so you want to make sure that over the course of your crop rotation that you're using as many different groups as you can and not over relying say on you know dual or our goal um, but trying to diversify and thereby limit the development of resistance okay and i've also listed here you know the some of the spectrum of control for these products and um yeah, you know, a lot of the products available in vegetables are basically grass weed herbicides, like uh, the group threes and the group 15s. They're basically grass weed products that work a little bit on some small seeded broadleaf uh, weeds, like like pigweed or lamb's quarters. Um, so there's not as many that control those larger seeded broadleaves, like. Um, uh, velvet leaf has a very large seed, mustards, some of the smart weeds. Uh, they're going to probably grow through these, uh, most of these products. And then, of course, you got to think about the timing, whether it's a, a residual product applied um, before planting or, or right after planting, uh, whether it's post, can you use it over the top of the crop? That's going to vary by crop. Uh, even varies by state with labeling, so it's it's very important that you read the label and you're you're completely on top of of what is the labeled use for each product. Um, and another thing to be aware of is is their interaction with plastic mulch. Some products um, you can use in conjunction with plastic mulch, some you can't. So uh, just another thing to be very aware of by reading the labels. Um, quickly, just want to talk about this interesting study um, that started with some residual herbicides and then followed that up with cultivation. And they cultivated with a rolling cultivator, a Lilliston. And this is a similar one. This is a photo I had in strawberries, uh, even though the trials were in broccoli. Um, Rolling cultivators are, are, I think, the best at con controlling weeds um, in residue. Um, they don't get gummed up with, with residue, and um, they've got a, a crossbar on the back of each, between each gang of um, tines here that, that throws out any extra residue. And so in this trial, they sprayed, um, so Devranol, uh, dual and goal, the products there in order, and either followed it up with cultivation or not. And, um, you know, as you expect, you can just see that where they followed up with cultivation, the control was higher. Um, and I just want to note that when you're using cultivation in conjunction with residual products, it's, it's just tough to determine when to cultivate based on how many weeds are emerging, based on the weather. Um, you obviously don't want to come through and cultivate 
bare ground and you're just going to break up that barrier that the residual products are offering. Um, but then on the other hand, you don't want to wait too long so that the weeds are too big for cultivation to control. Um, and you, know, you have to resort to hand weeding. So, uh, just a, another, um, um, very important dilemma that farmers have to face. Um, so if there's not any more questions, I, I guess I've, I've, I just have a few of the common species here, lambs, quarters, um, probably most of you have very prolific weed can produce, I think around 500,000 seeds if, um, it's not competing with anything. Uh, small seeded crop and one of the first to emerge, but does have a bit of an extended emergence. Ragweed is one of the first to emerge, one of the first that you see. Velvet leaf with that large seed. Velvet leaf, we, we've had some difficulties with velvet leaf in New York. The, a number of things make it hard to control with chemicals. It's got a hairy leaf so that the, you know, the, um, the chemical doesn't stick to the leaf as, as well. You may need a, uh, an adjuvant. And the leaves are drooping, so it, it can just run right off. Uh, and it's got that large seed, so it can emerge from deep in the soil, well, relatively deep for weeds, a, a few inches, um, potentially even growing through and having enough energy to grow through a, a residual herbicide layer. Gallon soga is uh, very common on vegetable farms. Um, I will say that the, the Achilles heel of gallon soga is that it has a um, very short half-life in the soil and um, um, it has almost no dormancy. So you can have several generations of, of gallon soga emerging. You know, like this one can produce seed, that seed can go in the ground mid-summer and then come up. Uh, whereas most seeds have to go through an overwintering period. Um, so if you're able to just have one really solid year of good control gallon soga, because most of it dies within one year in the soil, the seeds, that should take care of most of it. Um, so it can, it can be a big problem on certain farms, but it doesn't last if you can do a good job. Yeah, that's actually really nice to hear because I feel like we focus, I feel like we do focus on how long the seeds can last in the soil. Mm -hmm. So to, to understand that um, actually they're pretty short lived for the most mm -hmm. part. Um, yeah. It's reassuring. Yeah, that sounds good. I was just uh, replying to a couple of the uh, mm -hmm. comments in the chat. Um, Timothy asks about um, Japanese knotweed and bishop's weed, which are both perennials. And um, so actually uh, my, my advice, and, and I actually don't deal with perennials that often because I don't see them in annually tilled systems like, you know, fields that are, are growing vegetables or, um, or field crops, uh, corn, soybeans, or, or even annually tilled, um, you know, floriculture, flower systems. The tillage tends to take care of um, any perennials because they um, they have an extensive root system, and that's typically how they spread and how they overwinter. Uh, unlike the seeds of annuals, so they rely more on their root systems than the seeds typically. And the tillage will kind of break that up. Um, regular tillage, that is. Infrequent tillage can spread those root systems. Um, but if you're tilling once or twice every year, um, that typically takes care of those type of perennial weeds. Um, but yeah, so for Japanese knotweed and these you know, wild parsnip, um, they're typically not where you're growing vegetables, but maybe on the sides uh, or maybe near a hay field or something like that and kind of creeping in. And um, you know, wild parsnip you have to be careful of because it can be toxic. Um, and you know, a Japanese knotweed has so much energy stored underground in those root systems, it can really push through a lot of mulches. Um, so you do 
if you go the mulch route, you need a really thick and maybe a double layer of uh, like a silage tarp that they use to um, to cover um, you know hay silage on dairy farms. Um, repeated mowing can work, but um, yeah, anytime anytime that plant sends up a shoot that depletes the root system and that depletes its energy. But then anytime it has leaves, it sends energy down into that root system. So you wanna keep it from, from doing photosynthesis with those leaves and keep, keep those roots starved. Uh, don't let them do any photosynthesis. So if, if you were really dil diligent about mowing or, or um, you know, something that repeatedly removed all the leaves, then it would eventually starve over three or four years. And that's, that's the same as what you're doing basically with the tarping. Um, but if, uh, if chemicals are an option for you, this is one where, where Roundup or other systemic products are gonna be most effective because they actually go down into the root system. The plant transports it down into the root um, and it takes out that, that, that energy reserve there. Okay. Um, Paul asks about the half-life of wild parsnip seed. I, I don't happen to know, um, but uh, I think with probably a little bit of, of Googling, you could, you could probably find that. Um, best way to get rid of velvet weed. I think, I think you might mean velvet leaf. Um, which is an annual and it does have kind of a, a velvety um, soft leaf that's kind of nice to, to touch and a velvety stem. Um, and velvet leaf has bigger seeds than most of our typical annual weeds. Um, the seeds, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of sizable, maybe two or three times the size of most of our you know, annual weed seeds, even mustard seeds. Um, and so those seeds can emerge from a little bit deeper because they have the energy in them. So they can emerge from, you know, maybe three or four inches deep where most of our weed seeds are emerging from the top inch. Um, so if you're um, applying a residual herbicide, you've got to make sure it gets down deep. Um, the velvet leaf also emerges later in the season because it's, it's deeper. Um, so you have to make sure that um, you know, if you're growing vegetables that you stay on it later in the season, uh, right up through, you know, July or August. Um, and what else on velvet leaf? Um, uh, Shelly Wise, if, if you're able to share what you've tried so far, uh, that would be helpful. Um, Otherwise, um, Rose asks about black fabric. Um, I have encountered the burns. Okay, yes, for the wild parsnip. Um, okay, so it sounds like she has used the silage tarps. Okay, which is good. Uh, dogbane, dogbane. I I'm, I don't, I don't have any experience dealing with dog bane. I'm sorry, but if, if you do find that it is a perennial, then, then that's kind of my, my standard advice that applies to most perennials um, is what I've shared earlier about, um, you know, the repeated, either repeated tillage um, or, um, you know, uh, tarping or, or the systemic herbicides. Okay, Shelly replied about um, the velvet leaf, saying it grows in several raised beds at a community garden. So I've only used hand pulling. Yeah, hand pulling is fine, and you know it does have a nice soft stem, so you can just you know pull it out and and have have that nice softness, um, and just be sure that you're getting it before it sets seed. You know, and you can see. And in general, all of our annual weeds set seed in mid-August. Um, and so you wanna be sure that you're pulling it before that. Um, and if you're staying on that, 
then uh, it should just get easier and easier over time as you deplete the weeds, seeds that are in the soil. Okay, foxtail. Um, Dan asks, we had a big problem with sweet corn using a pre-emergent herbicide. Um, so I guess I, I guess I would ask, you know, which herbicide it was. Um, there are many different pre-emergents, you know, from dual um, to some of the pre-plant incorporated products um, like uh, Prefar. Um, what are some of the other ones? Treflon or um, Prowl, and all of those should should be very effective on the grasses. Um, but pre-emergence products typically only work on seeds. So if you've got, so if there's say perhaps some foxtail that emerged and they're just above the soil um, and then you go and spray, it might not control those. Um, so you wanna start clean probably with tillage or a burn down product, Dan, and then, um, you know, and apply that residual product to a clean slate. And I think that looks like about it for the questions coming in. Well, thank you so much, Brian. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, just a reminder, we've got the uh, CCA credit slide up on the screen. I made a bit of an error yesterday and showed the wrong code. So if you were in the class yesterday and got an error when you tried to submit, please reach out to us at CCE. You can um, reach me at ceh27 at cornell.edu, or you can just go to our website and navigate around and find uh, different email addresses. And Brian, do you wanna let them know how they can reach out to you and uh, plug your podcast one more time, please? Oh yeah, yeah, I'll type my, my email. It's uh, brian.brown at cornell.edu. And uh, yeah, I started the new uh, podcast series. I only have six episodes so far, but um, there it is again. Oh, no, that's another link. Let me find it. But anyways, it's up in the top of the chat. And um, I'll actually just link to our web page. No, it's not copying for some reason. Anyways, it's up in the top of the chat. Um, if folks can scroll up there and uh, yeah. So thanks for having me today and thanks for all the great questions.